Louise Martin, known as Kathy to her family and friends, was born on October 25, 1959. She crossed paths with Mike Odom during their high school years at the tender age of 16. Their young love blossomed, leading them to the decision of marriage. However, their plans were put on hold when Mike faced legal troubles for selling heroin to an undercover officer. Despite this setback, Kathy remained steadfast in her commitment to Mike, eagerly awaiting his release from prison. Two years later, they finally tied the knot and welcomed two beautiful children, Tasha and Sean, into the world. The Odom family resided in the opulent Harris County, Texas, where Kathy's father, Frankie Martin, graciously offered Mike a position at his sign business. Kathy poured her heart and soul into ensuring the success of their marriage, earning her reputation as a devoted mother who would move mountains for her beloved children. Tragedy struck on the fateful night of March 3, 1987, when Mike, away on business, attempted to reach Kathy but received no response. Concerned, he enlisted the help of a neighbor to check on his family. What they discovered was a scene of horror. Tasha, brutally beaten and unconscious, Sean unharmed, and Kathy, lifeless and mutilated in their bedroom. The heinous crime left the community in shock, with officers fearing the return of the perpetrator to finish what they had started. Tasha and Sean were both transported to the hospital, and it was mandated that they must not be left unattended. Kathy's father, Frankie, arrived at the crime scene and was instructed to go to the hospital to be with his grandchildren. While at the hospital, Frankie witnessed the events surrounding his daughter on a television screen. Meanwhile, Mike finally arrived back at the house, where the police officers paid close attention to his appearance. One of the officers observed red stains on Mike's shirt that resembled blood. A search of the Odom's residence uncovered blood in the bathroom, indicating that the perpetrator, potentially Mike, had attempted to clean up before departing. There were no signs of a forced entry, as all doors were secured except for the front door, suggesting that Kathy was familiar with her assailant. The multiple stab wounds on Kathy's body suggested a personal motive behind the crime. The neatly folded clothes found on the floor also provided clues to the investigators. It was theorized that the attacker targeted Tasha in order to gain access to Kathy. Tasha remained in critical condition at the hospital, in a coma and dependent on IVs as doctors fought to save her life. The focus of the investigation shifted towards Mike Odom, Tasha's father, who displayed emotional distress. However, investigators harbored suspicions about him due to inconsistencies in his alibi. Mike's clothing was sent to the forensic lab for analysis. Additionally, peculiar stains were discovered on the car floor of the neighbor, Tim Robinson, leading investigators to believe that Tim and Mike conspired to commit the crime. The possibility of Mike relapsing and seeking insurance money was also considered. Yet, a surprising turn of events was about to unfold. The estimations of the medical examiner suggest that Kathy's life was taken approximately six hours prior to the discovery of her body, which would place the time of her demise around one o'clock in the afternoon. Both Mike and Tim adamantly claim to have been diligently working during that time. As investigators meticulously scrutinized their alibis, a crucial witness emerged, none other than four-year-old Tasha Odom. Emerging from her coma, Tasha recounted to investigators that she vividly remembers a man entering the house, describing him as having yellow hair. However, neither Mike Odom nor Tim Robinson possessed blonde hair. Regrettably, the man's hair color was the only detail Tasha could recall. Subsequent forensic tests revealed that the stains found in Tim's car were motor oil, while the stains on Mike's shirt were paint. Moreover, their co-workers provided unwavering alibis for both individuals, and they both successfully passed polygraph tests. Consequently, Mike and Tim were exonerated, allowing investigators to shift their focus to the next suspect. This individual was none other than Kathy's sister, Charlene Martin, who was married to Greg Marquardt. Their tumultuous relationship began thanks to Mike, as Greg and Mike had been closely associated in the drug scene. Charlene, like Kathy, was only 16 years old when she met the man she would eventually marry. Greg, who was 25 at the time, 
should have raised eyebrows. The couple tied the knot in 1983, and soon after both Charlene and Kathy spiraled into addiction, mirroring Greg and Mike's destructive path. Charlene was known for stealing from her own parents for financial gain. However, Greg's affluent aunt and uncle repaid the Martins, and legal actions were avoided. While Mike and Kathy managed to turn their lives around, Greg and Shelley continued their criminal activities, leading to frequent incarcerations. Prior to Kathy's untimely demise, she confided in a friend about Greg's inappropriate advances towards her, which she promptly rebuffed while Shelley was occupied in another room with the baby. On hearing this, the investigators questioned Greg about his alibi on the night of Kathy's murder. Greg stated that he was not with his wife on the night of the crime. He was in the company of a man named Hampton Robinson III. It is worth noting that Robinson was an acquaintance of Charles Harrelson, who was the father of actor Woody Harrelson, and was convicted of killing a judge in 1982. Robinson had testified against Harrelson during his trial. Despite the police finding Greg's fingerprints and hair at the crime scene, it was argued that as a family member who had visited the house multiple times, this did not necessarily indicate guilt. Kathy's parents expressed their belief to investigators that Greg was responsible. Two days after Kathy's death, Frankie received a late-night call from the hospital where Tasha was being treated, informing him that Shelley and Greg had attempted to visit. Frankie instructed the hospital not to allow them in, citing suspicions about Greg and the unusual timing of their visit. Tasha's grandmother, Charlene Martins, recalled that Tasha reacted with fear upon seeing Greg at the hospital, and he was asked to leave. When questioned about the incident, Tasha could not recall if it was her Uncle Greg she saw with Kathy on the day of the attack due to her head injury. Greg, while denying any involvement, openly admitted his attraction to Kathy, particularly to her stomach. This preference was known to Kathy's friends, and it is notable that she was primarily stabbed in the stomach. During the interview, Greg requested to leave to refill a parking meter but did not return. He also declined to take a polygraph test, prompting investigators to further scrutinize his alibi. Shelley recounted that Greg chauffeured her to school at 10.30 a.m. on the day of the crime and retrieved her at 2.30 p.m. This luxurious four-hour time frame provided ample opportunity for Greg to carry out the crime. The medical examiner pinpointed the time of her demise around 1 p.m. that fateful day. Despite Kathy's unfortunate ordeal, this incident unfolded in an era predating the widespread use of DNA in cold case inquiries. Back then, serology was the method of choice, involving the intricate process of blood group typing. This technique was arduous, requiring a substantial sample size to yield results. The outcome was merely a blood type, lacking definitive proof. The blood type extracted from the evidence found on Kathy's body matched Greg Marquardt's blood type, type O, shared by approximately half the population, rendering it inconclusive. With insufficient evidence, the case languished in obscurity for a considerable period. For Frankie, the realization that the perpetrator of his daughter's demise was wedded to his other daughter was a harrowing revelation. In 1998, a specialized cold case unit was established, with Kathy Odom's case being one of their initial investigations. By then, DNA testing had advanced significantly, enabling the extraction of a DNA profile from the biological evidence in Kathy's case. The results indicated that Greg Marquardt belonged to the exclusive 2% of the populace who could have been the culprit, a marked improvement from the previous 50% probability. Greg promptly provided investigators with an alibi, claiming he was engaged in a consensual relationship with Kathy and was in her company on the morning of her demise. He maintained that she was alive when he departed. Despite doubts cast on his account, Greg remained unapprehended due to insufficient evidence for a conviction. The crucial task was to establish his presence at the scene of the crime. Investigators sought the expertise of Catherine Long, employed at Orchid Cellmark, a prestigious private forensic laboratory in Dallas, Texas. Catherine devised a unique plan to unravel the mystery surrounding Kathy's crime. 
she and her team engaged in a peculiar activity of choking each other to see if skin cells would be transferred from the perpetrator to the victim. Astonishingly, they discovered a significant exchange of skin cells during the act. The investigators scoured through Kathy's evidence file in search of any trace of the perpetrator's skin cells. Their focus shifted to the electrical cord that was used to bind Kathy's hands. Fortunately, the cord had been stored in a paper bag rather than a plastic one. The paper bag's breathable nature ensured that the item remained dry, thus extending the lifespan of the DNA. This preservation method proved to be more effective than storing it in a plastic bag. The blood-stained cord was meticulously swabbed by the investigators to gather all possible evidence. Subsequent testing unveiled two genetic profiles, Kathy Odom's and Greg Markwart's. The presence of Markwart's DNA on the cord indicated his involvement as the perpetrator. Finally, on December 18, 2002, Greg Markwart was apprehended and charged with Kathy's murder. During his time in prison, Markwart confessed to a fellow inmate, revealing that he was under the influence of heroin when he committed the heinous act. His chilling account of the events that transpired at Kathy's house shed light on the brutal truth. The advancements in DNA technology ultimately led to his identification as the culprit 15 years after the crime. Six months following his arrest, Greg's affluent aunt passed away, bequeathing him with hundreds of thousands of dollars and a share in her opulent abode. The Martins opted to take legal action against him, entangling the estate in a legal battle that hindered him from utilizing those funds for his defense. In 2004, Greg Markward entered a plea of guilty and was found guilty on all counts. By July of the same year, he was handed a 45-year prison sentence. After serving four years of his term, he succumbed to liver disease in 2008 at the age of 56. Sergeant Roger Wedgworth was quoted as saying, Couldn't happen to a more deserving individual. Shelley and her parents lost touch following the crime. While they believed in his culpability, she stood by Markwart's side. It was rumored that Shelley continued to stand by Markwart and maintained his innocence for an extended period. A couple of years post the crime, the Martins relocated to Oklahoma. Subsequently, it appeared that Shelley reconciled with her parents and she too relocated to Oklahoma to be in close proximity to them. Kathy's father, Frankie, expressed, It does not bring back Kathy. I will always cherish her memory, the home she created, and the moments we shared. Losing a child is always a profound sorrow. Julie Ann Gonzalez, a 21-year-old resident of Dripping Springs, Texas, in 2010, was married to George De La Cruz, but they were estranged and not living together. They were in the process of getting a divorce. Julie and George shared a young daughter named Layla, who was around two years old at the time. Julie was known for her hard work as a pharmacy technician, dedication to her studies, and the time she spent with her daughter. Her loved ones described her as a kind-hearted individual who took her motherly responsibilities seriously. On March 26, 2010, George claimed that Julie had dropped off their daughter with him, mentioning that she was going on a trip for a few days. However, Julie's family became concerned when she did not contact them as expected. By 11 p.m. that night, Julie's aunt and mother reported her missing to the Austin, Texas police. Despite her family's worries, the authorities stated that there was no concrete evidence to suggest that Julie had not left voluntarily. Her family highlighted that Julie was a devoted mother who would not abandon her daughter without a word. Additionally, they emphasized that Julie was always in touch with them and her sudden disappearance was out of character. The following day, Julie's family and her new boyfriend, Aaron, received text messages from her. While her sister believed the messages were genuinely from Julie due to the use of her nickname, her aunt, mother, and boyfriend were skeptical. Aaron, in particular, had just received a message from Julie indicating that she was ending their relationship. Her mother was utterly astonished because she was aware that Julie was deeply infatuated with him. Julie, or someone pretending to be her, had shared a message on Facebook claiming she was feeling down 
and had also posted on her MySpace page. On MySpace, Julie had penned that she had encountered a man named James in Colorado and was eager to begin a new chapter of her life there. Julie's aunt and mother were certain that these messages were not from Julie. She would never abandon her daughter, and the writing style did not match hers. Aaron inquired about his middle name from Julie. The individual on the other end refused to engage in games and ceased communication with Julie's family members. Investigators were still uncertain whether she had left of her own accord or if there was foul play involved, but they did speak with George as he was the last person to see Julie alive. George simply mentioned that Julie had dropped off their daughter and then departed abruptly. Julie's family initiated their own search. Her aunt drove around South Austin and spotted Julie's new car in the Walgreens parking lot. She rushed inside and scoured the store for Julie, but she was nowhere to be seen. Alarmed by the situation, Julie's aunt contacted her mother. Together they checked Julie's trunk but found nothing. They did discover a paper bag in the back seat containing asthma medication for Julie's daughter. It was out of character for Julie not to provide such crucial medication for her own child. Julie's family inquired with a Walgreens employee if Julie had visited the store. After showing him a photo, he mentioned that she looked familiar. They also inquired about the car parked outside. He informed them that a young woman had entered the store claiming to have car troubles. The police obtained surveillance footage from Walgreens. While there were several women resembling Julie, she herself was not captured on camera. Subsequently, Julie's family inundated the city with billboards, posters, and distributed T-shirts featuring Julie's image. The authorities scrutinized Julie's phone records and social media profiles. Both her phone and social media had fallen silent. There had been no activity since March 27, 2010, the day after she disappeared. Victoria de la Cruz, George's mother, urgently contacted the police, requesting their presence at her residence. She had discovered a sizable hole in the storage shed of their home. Victoria explained that she had begun digging but became frightened, prompting her to call the authorities. When detectives arrived, Victoria appeared disheveled and visibly shaken. The hole she reported bore a striking resemblance to a grave. George claimed it was merely an electrical trench, but investigators proceeded with digging, only to find no trace of Julie. Upon obtaining Julie's bank statements, the police discovered that George had used her card at Walmart and Best Buy on the day she vanished. At Best Buy, he purchased an Xbox points card due to his gaming obsession, which was a contributing factor to his divorce from Julie. Victoria granted permission for a search of the house, where the police uncovered items from both stores and a receipt from Best Buy. Surveillance footage from both establishments showed George accompanied by his daughter. Wireless expert Jim Cook analyzed George's phone to track his movements on March 26, 2010, comparing them to Julie's phone. The phones moved in unison, indicating George had possession of Julie's phone. Furthermore, George accessed both his and Julie's MySpace accounts from the same IP address. The police also delved into George's Xbox activity, revealing his extensive gaming sessions lasting up to 15 hours a day. However, on March 26th, he refrained from playing for approximately 20 hours. The authorities suspected George of foul play in Julie's disappearance, yet they lacked substantial evidence to confirm her demise. Regrettably, the investigation grew cold, leaving Julie's family in a state of uncertainty for three long years, forced to share custody with George. Julie's mother persistently inquired about her daughter's return, to which George repeatedly assured her that it would happen someday. However, on September 13, 2013, George de la Cruz was apprehended and accused of ending Julianne Gonzalez's life. Despite being offered a reduced sentence in exchange for cooperation, George adamantly denied any involvement, opting to plead not guilty. As the trial commenced in April 2015, George displayed no remorse, only nervousness. The prosecution, lacking Julie's body, aimed to convince the jury that she was beyond recovery. Although items like a knife, ammunition, and charred clothing were discovered in the Dela Cruz's property, 
Defense attorneys McCabe and Lowerman argued that the prosecution's case was riddled with inconsistencies and unanswered queries. George, described as an immature gamer, was deemed incapable of orchestrating the disposal of Julie's remains and concealing evidence within the given time frame. Ultimately, on April 22, 2015, George Delacruz was convicted, prompting a moment of solace for Julie's grieving family. In October of 2016, George, who was 27 years old at the time, received a life sentence. Currently, he is serving his sentence at the Jim Ferguson Unit in unincorporated Madison County, Texas. He will have the opportunity for parole in 2043. Julie's family expressed their hope that George will eventually disclose Julie's whereabouts. They are eager for him to inform his daughter about the truth behind her mother's disappearance. In February 2023, a fire destroyed Julie's mother, Sandra Soto's house. Fortunately, Sandra and her family managed to escape unharmed thanks to their dog alerting them. Despite losing everything in the fire, a fundraiser was organized at Jack's Roadhouse in San Marcos to assist the family. The event included homemade barbecue and live music. The family found solace in the unexpected support they received from strangers as they navigated through this challenging time. Samantha, Julie's sister, remarked, We have faced numerous hardships, and initially I felt overwhelmed by this latest news. However, today's events demonstrate the enduring love and backing from not only our relatives and friends, but also individuals who are familiar with my sister, Julianne Gonzalez's story. It reassures us that our family and her story are not forgotten.